Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for joining today's Hack webinar. Every single Friday we do a webinar. And today we're going to be talking about arbitral proceedings with Matt Marwan Sa'ar. First, as always, we start by introducing ourselves and why we do these webinars. Hack is a legal tech company founded with the mission of digitizing justice making legal services accessible to everyone through technology. We're trying to cause a legal revolution through the practice management software, MyHack. And if you're a lawyer here, MyHack can really help you attract more clients, productize and digitize your entire law firm whilst networking with other lawyers worldwide. So we invite you to join the 6,000 MyHack subscribers by going to this link and claiming your free MyHack account right now, lawyer.hack.me. Hack is led by an international board from the Middle East, Europe, and the Americas. And we have a very wide partnership ecosystem including, but not limited to, NVIDIA, the Tripoli Bar Association, and many, many, many others. We're proud to be one of the largest legal communities in the Middle East, organizing huge conferences and weekly webinars for the development of legal talent and legal professionals all over the Middle East. Today, our speaker is Matt Marwan Sa'ar. Matt Marwan is an esteemed lecturer and professor in multiple universities. And he is the managing partner of SAS Lawyers and Advocates. The structure of this webinar will be as follows. We will be giving the floor to Matt Marwan to speak. Afterwards, there will be a Q&A session. And for those of you who stay until the end, you will be receiving a signed certificate of participation. Thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Matt Marwan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending uh, this webinar uh, about the tri arbitral tribunal's duty to efficiently manage the arbitration proceedings. So uh, let me start by introducing a little bit of the subject and why it is uh, becoming more and more increasingly important. So as you know, throughout the uh, last, throughout the second half of the 20th century, arbitration has become the preferred or the most dominant uh, method for resolving international disputes. Its advantages are widely known. I don't want to delve into that. Everybody knows uh, what are the perceived advantages of arbitration in uh, resolving international disputes. Uh, this being said, international arbitrations nowadays suffers from increasing costs and duration. So what used to be said before uh, for arbitration that it is cheaper and quicker than course litigation is not anymore uh, the reality. Uh, it is uh, less efficient, becoming less efficient than it was promised. And uh, if you look a little bit at uh, the business people reviews of arbitration, uh, they have several times and several places expressed dissatisfaction with the uh, process. So therefore efforts are start are thus made by the arbitration community in general, and especially by the international arbitration institutions to improve the existing rules and practices in order to tackle these inconveniences. Uh, uh, at the very center of the current difficulties of arbitration in general, but international arbitration in particular, is the management of the arbitral proceedings. Uh, the issue is becoming immensely relevant for uh, the whole arbitration community and the whole arbitration world on both the international and domestic dimensions. 
actually uh, many of the practices and techniques that are well settled now in international arbitrations, such as the case management conferences, uh, how to organize uh, written witness statements, uh, the experts, how to appoint the experts, are now also gaining prominence in domestic practice. Let me open a, a quick bracket here just I, uh, to explain that, uh, or probably all of you know that there are two uh, categories of arbitration. The domestic arbitration that is regulated usually by the civil procedure codes and laws and specific arbitration laws of each country. And you have international arbitration in general, which deals with international uh, disputes. Uh, I do not want there are different uh, definitions of what or uh, of what uh, an, an international dispute is, but since we are in Lebanon, let me just give you an example. Under Article 810 of the Civil Code of uh, Civil Procedure Code of Lebanon, there is a clear definition. Uh, it is an economic-based definition of international arbitration. International arbitration is the uh, is the arbitration that concerns inter uh, international uh, uh, commerce. So whenever an arbitration is related to international commerce, it is considered international under Lebanese law, while the others, uh, uh, while arbitration when disputes concern internal, domestic, uh, mat commercial matters, they are deemed to be domestic arbitration. So what is the difference? The difference is that international arbitration is governed by a specific set of rules set out in the Code of Civil Procedure itself uh, uh, that are somehow different from the rules governing domestic arbitrations. Also, there are a lot of similarities and the chapter in the Civil Procedure Code that refers, uh, that governs International arbitration sometimes refers to the chapter or to the section governing domestic arbitration. So, uh, what I was saying, I close the, uh, the bracket now and uh, go back to my return to, uh, to the subject. So, what I was saying that many of the practices and techniques that were created in by the in international arbitration. Uh, are now being more and more adopted also in domestic arbitrations. Uh, there are new instruments that have been that are being now uh, working uh, uh, working in international arbitrations. Uh, there are the old existing measures that are being fine tuned, and domestic arbitration is also starting to implement these uh, instruments in the international level. Now, uh, after this quick introduction, I would uh, like uh, I'll start with the I think I have lost something. Okay. So, where does the duty uh, from where uh, the uh, uh, the duty of to efficiently manage the arbitral proceeding comes from. First of all, it comes from the arbitration rules in the world. Arbitral tribunals have a duty. It's an obligation. It's not a right. It's not a possibility. It's a duty. It's an obligation to make every effort, effort to. Sorry, I have issues with my. Okay, they need, they have to make an, uh, every effort to conduct arbitration in a time and cost effective man manner. So there are two issues. It has to be time effective and cost effective. Of course, having regards to the complexity and the value of the dispute, uh, the measures that could be taken in a very small uh, dispute are main, uh, maybe more flexible than the measures to be taken or to be applied when the value of the dispute is higher financial. Uh, this rule or this, uh, due, this principle is now being enshrined in a certain number of international arbitration rules. 
For example, Article 22, first paragraph of the ICC rules. Also, you can find similar provisions in Article 17, paragraph 1 of the UNCTRA rules and Article 14.42 of the NCIA rules and so on. I'm not going to cite all the international arbitration uh, rules uh, that are that provide for this principle. So let's see what this principle contains. Well, uh, maybe the most detailed uh, text on the uh, uh, on explaining the duty of the arbitral tribunal to conduct uh, the arbitration in a uh, time and cost effective manner is the text the guide that has been uh, drafted in uh, 2007 by the ICC under the form of a, of a report called the Report on Controlling Time and Cost in Arbitration. And this report became now an appendix to the ICC rules uh, since uh, 2012, uh, under the name of Case Management Techniques to Control Time and Cost in Arbitration. Uh, also, in 2014, the ICC publishes, uh, published its Guide on the Effective Management of Arbitration, a guide for in-house counsel and other party representatives. So, uh, there are uh, two texts, mainly the case management techniques that are now an appendix to the ICC rules. And then you have the guide on the effective management of arbitration, which is addressed mainly to in-house counsel and party representative, that, which means that it is addressed to the lawyers, how the lawyers and the representative of the parties in international arbitration can cooperate together or can, uh, what are the measures that they should take uh, to uh, ensure that the arbitration is conducted in a uh, time and cost-effective manner. So uh, I have, why I'm giving this example? I'm giving this example because it comes from the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce. The International Chamber of Commerce uh, is an organization, it's an, uh, it's an international business organization that is based in Paris. It has been uh, established in the 1920, so immediately after the end of the First World War. And since then, it manages uh, the International Court of Arbitration, which is until today uh, the largest uh, international arbitration institution in the world with the a longest uh, track record of international arbitration cases. So that's why I'm mentioning this, if uh, the, uh, the guides that were uh, drafted by this institution in particular, because it is uh, the major, or at least one of the major arbitral institution in the world. And usually it uh, it is at the upfront of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the development of international arbitration regulation in the world. So whenever the ICC usually uh, uh, issues something or regulation or new rules or any guide, uh, practical guide, usually all other institutions follow uh, very quickly. Okay, what does the guides what provides for? What are the topics that are usually uh, uh, provided for in the ICC guide, uh, which contributes to an efficient conduct of the arbitration and, uh, it, and the recommendations that are made to the arbitrators and to the lawyers at the same time to uh, follow in order to reach that goal. There are a list of uh, Plenty of topics. I will not. Uh, it is. It will take a lot of time to develop each of these topics. But I will uh, just uh, 
mention a few topics uh, that are, I, in my view, are the most important. The first topic that is regulated in the guide or that is uh, mentioned in the guide is the request for arbitration. So what should the request of arbitration contain? Uh, what are the initial information, the necessary information to enable the institution or the arbitrators to start the arbitration proceedings? Then how the answer and the counterclaim should be uh, uh, should be filed or should be presented because there is after like before uh, state courts like lit court litigation there is a request for arbitration which starts the case which is the claim and then you have an answer and perhaps counterclaim so like in the very same way the things work in uh, court litigation uh, then you have a very very important issue which has been uh, a subject for discussions for years and years now, uh, which is multi-party arbitration. This is not uh, uh, it does not present any difficulties before state and state litigation because we have the uh, in, uh, in the civil codes of procedures everywhere you have the possibility to join third parties itkhal talabat itkhal in the proceedings. While in arbitration, it's much more difficult because, as you know, arbitration is very consensual, is based on parties' consent. So if two parties sign an agreement with an arbitration or agree to arbitrate their dispute, it doesn't mean that a third party who was not a party to that agreement can be usually joined uh, to the arbitration. It's very difficult. Also, now there are several techniques that enable the party to do that. but. Uh, there is uh, uh, there are uh, now a lot of guidance uh, on uh, how to deal with multi-party issues uh, in order uh, to keep it uh, to keep the arbitration on track and keep it as much as possible time and cost effective. Also, uh, the guides uh, recommend sometimes uh, what we call an early determination of issues. What do I mean by that? Early determination of issues concerns sometimes a case has been is submitted, uh, a claim has been raised, and there are issues that could be decided immediately. There is no need to further wait until the end of the proceedings, until the final decision or award to decide on these issues. These issues can be cleared, if you want, very early in the proceedings, and the guides recommend the arbitrators to try to agree with the parties that some issues could be determined very early. So uh, it will help, and especially it will make the rest of the proceedings more uh, efficient. Let me give you an example of that. An example of the of an early termination of issues, if there is a matter of jurisdiction, competence, ikhtisas. So normally, sometimes, and as we see in court litigation, even if a challenge to jurisdiction is raised, sometimes the court says, I will keep it until the end. I will decide on my jurisdiction with the final decision, which means that the parties will have to plead the cases, they have to submit to exchange all the, uh, the, uh, the written submissions until the end of the proceedings. And then the, co the court will decide whether it, uh, it is competent or not. This is uh, not very time efficient, nor cost efficient, because as we have said, uh, costs can be uh, much higher in arbitration than in uh, normal court litigation, state court litigation. So if the arbitral tribunal or the arbitrator wants to declare that he is not competent for this in this case, or he doesn't have jurisdiction for one reason or another, it's better, it's always better to do it in the beginning. Of the proceedings. Practically, uh, the arbitrator or the tribunal will ask the parties to exchange uh, briefs, submissions very quickly and very under very short uh, uh, under very short timelines, a very short timelines to decide, and then so to decide whether. Uh, it has competence, or, uh, the tribunal has competence, is competent or not. Uh, I think we have an issue the, with the screen. Can we go back to the, uh, to the slide? Uh, 
Um, I think the slides are running faster than I am. Can we go? Marwan, okay, do you now. need me to help you with the slides? I don't know. Um, the uh, you know the the arrows here are disappearing. The uh, the comments. I'm sorry for that. If you need me to control the slides, I can do that. No, I'm fine. I just need. Okay, thank you. Great. So another issue is also uh, the guides, the international guides. Now you see it's it's moving. Rounds, uh, uh, the uh, there is a recommendation concerning how many rounds of written submissions we need to make. Compare, if we need to compare with the court litigation, for example, usually there are, for each party, two rounds of uh, submissions. There is the first the claim document, followed by an answer by the respondent, then another answer by the claimant and the last uh, answer for the respondent. This is the normal round uh, uh, of exchange of submissions in the state courts. Uh, usually most of arbitral proceedings follow the same uh, sequence of documents, but uh, I think there is a problem with the, uh, with the slides. Can we go back? Yes. Should I go back or forward? Yes, yes, yes. I will. Uh, no, back, back. We are still on the same slide. OK. Do you want me to stay here? Oh, Sean is here. Just Someone is controlling the screen on yeah, your side. We're staying here. We're staying here. Uh, we're staying here for the time being. OK, so sometimes, in some cases, we don't need to, uh, uh, small cases or cases that do not raise uh, legal or fact or com complicated legal or factual issues. Sometimes there is no need for two submissions for each party. Yes. Uh, and one round of submission could be uh, sufficient. Uh, the uh, there's a problem with the with the PowerPoint. Can you go back to slide, please? Uh, Matt Marwan, the control is coming from your side, not from our side. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not touching anything. I'm not touching anything. Should I stay here? Yes. One important issue as well, and I will uh, develop that in a bit, is document production. So how many, uh, whether and in which circumstances a party can ask the other party, the opposing party, to produce a document that, uh, is, that is in its possession and not, uh, so can we force a party to submit documents that are in their position? This is a very important issue in the in arbitration, uh, and I will uh, be uh, I will be I will give you some uh, more detailed insight on that in a bit. Also, do we another issue that could be that could have a shuhud. Do we need uh, to produce uh, uh, witnesses, uh, fact witnesses? Usually, uh, witnesses of facts should be, whether they should be uh, with statements and uh, they should pro uh, file uh, witness statements before being heard orally at the hearing or not. The same also uh, applies to expert witnesses because uh, sometimes, especially in international arbitration, expert witnesses or the use of experts is very, very uh, common, very frequent. Why is that? Uh, because first, there are the technical experts that we know, we all know from our uh, court litigation experience, if it's a construction matter, for example, if it is, uh, we need experts, if it's a financial matter we, or accounting issue dispute, we need the experts. Uh, but also international arbitration, in most of the cases, we use legal experts. 
What? Why is that? Because international the international arbitrators are not necessarily uh, 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 qualified or trained in the law applicable to the dispute. Each dispute is governed by the law of one country. Uh, there are very few disputes, very few legal issues that are governed by an, inter an international uh, legal uh, instrument. Uh, there are a uh, few cases, but mostly in any uh, arbitration based on a contract, the contract itself, and we all have seen that in the contract, there is a clause saying this contract is governed or interpreted or executed in accordance with the law of such country. So when the dispute arises, uh, the arbitrators may not be uh, qualified in the law of that country. So they will have they will ask for expert witnesses who are usually uh, lawyers uh, pro or professors of law and from that country who can explain, assist the arbitrators and the tribunal with how to interpret or what is the situation of uh, uh, of uh, a certain uh, issue, a certain topic under the law of that country. Uh, there are also sometimes uh, recommendations in the guides about the hearing. Hearing. Do we need to have a hearing on the merits? Uh, uh, more and more, more often, often now, uh, parties can ag may agree with the arbitrators that there is no need for a hearing. Uh, it is uh, different from uh, the situation in court litigation, where the court has always to uh, fix a hearing date during which, as we all know, we can uh, nothing uh, usually happen. It's just to close the proceedings. Uh, in arbitration, this is not necessary. Uh, so the parties may agree with the arbitrators that no hearing is needed, and the arbitrators can decide the, on the case, the case based on the written submission only. Not necessarily, there is no pleadings, unless there are experts that needs to be examined at the hearing. So usually if there are no ex experts or witnesses to be heard at the hearing, uh, parties often agree that uh, there is no need to hold a hearing uh, uh, because sometimes the hearing can be expensive, especially if it's not if they are not uh, uh, made online. Before uh, the corona and the pandemic, most of the hearings were uh, took, used to take place live, and it's back again now. So it means that you have three arbitrators, let's say one from each country, because this is how it works in international arbitration, parties from different countries, lawyers from several countries, and they need all to travel to one place and organize the hearing over there. You have to hire a big room and rooms for the uh, arbitrators, rooms for the lawyers and the uh, and the clients. So it can be very, very costly. Now, the trend is that whenever we don't have witnesses nor experts to be heard at the hearing. There is no need to come to a hearing where each party will repeat orally what uh, uh, this party has already said in his written, uh, in their written, uh, written submissions. And so we dis it dispenses the parties from the hearing and the arbitrators usually accepts parties agreement unless they have a specific need to call the parties for a party's lawyer for a quick hearing where the tribunal may ask questions or clarification to the some clarifications to the to the lawyers in the case. And finally, if there is a hearing, usually we need to parties want and the arbitrators needs to agree whether post-hearing briefs are necessary. Post-hearing briefs are exactly like uh, uh, what we call in our Lebanese uh, court systems, muzakkarat ba'da khitam al muhakam So do we need uh, really post-hearing briefs or not? Because post-hearing briefs also can be, can take time, it can be a sub substantial, and sometimes there is no need if a, uh, to present, to submit post-hearing briefs if uh, a hearing has been held, uh, especially that Usually, hearings are uh, reported by court reporting, by court reporting uh, companies. 
uh, everything is uh, recorded, everything, and there is a uh, a transcript, a uh, uh, a full transcript of the hearing, not only a summary that is uh, registered on the, on the in the minutes, like in the in our uh, in the Venice courts, but everything that's said in the hearing is recorded and transcribed uh, in writing. So the uh, arbitrators can go back to these transcripts and understand in detail what has been said during the, uh, the hearing. Okay, so these are the uh, main topics that uh, are uh, where attention is recommended uh, for the parties and the arbitrators at the same time, because the way we deal with these topics can have uh, very important consequences on the time and the cost of the arbitration. And therefore, there are recommendations now uh, for specific ways to address each of these topics. I gave you uh, just, I just gave you some examples in order to reduce the time implication and the cost implication of the arbitration through these topics. Uh, I will now turn to three practical situations three practical situations that I have encountered in my uh, in my professional experience as an arbitrator. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, and I will, exp and these are uh, very common actually in, uh, in arbitration, international arbitration, more than domestic arbitration, but it can, they can occur in a domestic arbitration as well. And I will, uh, based on these three practical situations, I will try to summarize how the arbitrators should deal with uh, these uh, practical situations. The first one, the first situation that, uh, that usually uh, arise in, in, in arbitration is uh, the issue of document production. What do we mean by document production? Document production usually refers to the extent to which one party to an arbitration may demand that another party to the arbitration, or even a third party sometimes who's not a part of arbitration, produces documents in the proceedings. Most arbitration rules and most arbitration laws in the countries do not address this topic. It is left to the arbitrator's discretion. So, uh, tribunal's power to order production of documents usually stems from the procedural law of the seat, not from the arbitration law, because as, I, as I've just said, the arbitration legislation of the country, of all of the most of the countries do not address these issues, but uh, this procedural law, the civil procedure code that applies before the courts of each country usually addresses this issue. So, and so there are different approaches to the issues in national law and before state courts. And the arbitrators usually should be inspired by the, uh, how the courts of the country where the arbitration is taking place uh, uh, usually deals with these matters. And here there are a very, uh, <clears throat> important uh, differences between uh, legal cultures and legal uh, uh, procedures in each of the countries how to uh, to deal with uh, document production issues i will start first with common law jurisdictions common law jurisdictions have a very different approach from civil law jurisdictions that and i will get back to that in a bit in common law jurisdictions, there are two main uh, practices, two main uh, countries that inspire most of the common law jurisdictions. There is the US practice and the UK practice. Even they, uh, if they uh, re uh, belong to the same family and uh, the US practice is influenced by UK practice because it has its source in UK practice, the, the US courts have developed the uh, uh, the document production process uh, much more than the UK practice. So in the US, 
there is uh, the US, US laws uh, allow a very broad document production. We call it, uh, you know, uh, fishing expeditions between brackets. This is uh, uh, provided for in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure in the US and the Rule 26. What do we mean by fishing expedition? <clears throat> Excuse me. We mean by that that the lawyers usually make very, very, very large uh, requests to the other party to produce documents. Sometimes not all the documents that are requested are relevant to the case. What they try to make is that, like fishermen, they throw the net and once they uh, and once they take it to shore, they will open it and they will start looking in the documents that they have requested and obtained if there is something that could be helpful for their case or not. So technically, it is the broadest uh, type of document production. It is not followed in all other countries. It's very specific to the United States in, in courts and in arbitration. However, this is a very costly and time uh, 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 and time inefficient uh, procedure. Uh, sometimes uh, the uh, in the U.S. practice, the requests uh, requests can concern hundreds of thousands of documents. And now, with all of the documents being coming electronic, uh, the requests will will concern servers in their entirety. So they will ask experts or they will ask the other party to provide them with copies of their servers, for example, the servers of their clients. This is very, very broad and very costly and it's not always efficient. Uh, under US UK practice, the proceeding, the procedure is very uh, much limited. So the disclosure of documents is accepted, is ordered by the court or by the arbitrators, only if those documents either help or damage the case of the party producing them or the case of another party. So under the civil procedure rule, part 31, a party can ask for a limited disclosure of documents, but the party must precise or must specify how these documents, if produced, can help their case or can damage the case of the, uh, of the opposing part. It's not open, it's not a fishing expedition like in the US. Let's move now to civil law jurisdiction. Uh, in civil law jurisdictions that are civil laws that are based on uh, usually similar to French law, or uh, who have their sources in French law, like all of the Arab countries, for example, uh, the, uh, there are very limited disclosure or discovery available under the control of the court. A party to a litigation can request the court to compel his opponent to submit any useful written document or paper in his possession. The, in the following limited instances, First, if the law allows the party to ask for their submission or delivery, if the document, second, if the document is joint between him and his opponent, or if the opponent bases his claim on it at any stage of the lawsuit. So you can find uh, these conditions in any civil uh, procedure code of the Arab countries. You have it in the UAE. You have it in Qatar, in uh, France, in, uh, and uh, more specifically in Lebanon, you have the same article, the same provision in Article 203 of the Lebanese Code of Civil Procedures. So now we know also that the rules of evidence, Qawa'ad uh, Isbat, that applies before the state courts do not necessarily apply. In, uh, in arbitration, unless the parties agree to apply them, or the parties may agree to apply other rules of evidence. Parties are not bound to follow the same rule of evidence, same rules of evidence that are applied before the courts in the place or in the country where the arbitration is taking place. 
So, for example, uh, there, the International Bar Association, which is an association of uh, bar, which is uh, an association of lawyers uh, that uh, do a lot of academic work, has uh, drafted years ago, since uh, 20, 24 years ago, uh, rules that are not mandatory. These are guide guidelines on uh, how to obtain evidence in international arbitration or in arbitration uh, more broadly, more generally, not only in international, but it can also they can also apply in domestic arbitration if the parties agree to their application. The IBA rules, for example, can be used as guidance, and uh, they provide for uh, document production. Uh, the position the IBA rules uh, 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 have, that IBA rules have taken regarding document production is, you know, um, uh, in the middle between the very extensive common law and especially U.S. Uh, document production process and the very limited uh, civil law uh, system of document production. So they have imagined a system that is in between uh, both systems, uh, which and there are rules, specific rules, how uh, the document production and arbitration can apply. But again, this is not a law. This is not an international convention. This is what we call soft law. These are guidance that can be used, provided that the parties in the arbitrators agree from in the beginning of the arbitration on the use of the IBA guidelines and the IBA rules for the production of evidence. So uh, therefore, it is recommended now to agree from the beginning on the IBA rules. There are also other similar rules now. Uh, more recently, the Prague, uh, there are the Prague rules. Uh, it's also a set of rules concerning the production of evidence and document production that are more uh, close to the civil law systems and the uh, common law system that are also being proposed to the parties. They can use them in the other, they can agree on their application and in international arbitrations. However, the IBA rules remain very, very, uh, very uh, popular with arbitrators and uh, lawyers alike in international arbitrations, and they are used at least as guidance, if not as a mandatory uh, provision. So uh, this, uh, the adoption of the IBA rules at the beginning of the arbitration can help uh, managing the arbitration process, especially in terms of document production. So we don't fall into the excessive, uh, broad, excessively broad approach of the US uh, document production style, fishing expedition style or discovery style, and nor uh, be limited in the very narrow uh, conditions of civil law systems. So it's always useful to use these uh, uh, rules as a guidance and to agree with the parties on the use from the beginning of the arbitration. Second issue that always uh, that always arise, especially when there are document uh, production requests, is confidentiality. Uh, the, the example is very, uh, very common. A party asks the other party or asks the arbitrators to compel the other party to produce a document that is in, in, in the other party's possession uh, because the, uh, this document, according to the requesting party, helps, uh, helps that party win its case or uh, helps in... Uh, uh, or can make the other party lose its own case. The other party objects and says, well, this is a confidential document. Uh, I cannot produce it. It, is, it contains sensitive information. Uh, one example, from, uh, one example. Uh, let's take a Lebanese example. If this is a financial dispute between two parties and one party uh, request the production of the bank statements of the other parties. As you know, uh, bank statements are protected by bank secrecy law in Lebanon. 
So the other party can say, well, I cannot uh, produce it, produce it as a bank statement because this is protected. You cannot force me, oblige me to produce these documents as I am protected uh, by the uh, bank secrecy law and the conditions for the lifting of the bank secrecy in that case are not met. So this is one important issue. How do we, how do arbitrators deal with issues of confidentiality in arbitration? First, you need to know that usually uh, national arbitration laws, the law of arbitration of the of, the, of each country may sometimes uh, provide on uh, for a solution to the issue of confidentiality. However, there is no common approach to the issue of confidentiality in these issues. Let me give you some examples. In France, for example, uh, confidentiality, for example, uh, and not only confidentiality of the, the uh, documents produced, but the confidentiality of the whole proceedings is dealt for in the Code of Civil Procedures. What do I mean here by confidentiality? Uh, uh, if I need to produce a document that is confidential or set, contains sensitive information into uh, before the arbitrators, I need to make sure that if I accept to produce this, such document, this document will be kept confidential by the arbitrators in uh, the arbitration proceedings. So what does the law say here? But in France, for example, the confidentiality is guaranteed only for domestic arbitration. If it's an international arbitration taking pla a place in France, there is no guarantee whatsoever of confidentiality. So the con uh, you can produce uh, a party can produce confidential document or sensitive information. These documents can be used by the arbitrators in their decision, and the decision is public afterwards. There is no confidentiality, unless the parties agree on specific rules on confidentiality from the beginning. So this is very, very important to remember. If you are in France and you have an arbitration and you want to make sure that all the documents that you produce in that arbitration, all the information that you provide the arbitrators with in that and uh, remains confidential, you have to agree from the beginning on confidentiality, specific confidentiality provisions uh, at the beginning of the arbitration. This is a signed agreement. In England, for example, the Arbitration Act of 1996 is completely silent on the issue. However, case law jurisprudence provides that the parties to arbitration and the tribunal are under an implied duty to maintain the confidentiality, even in the absence of a specific agreement. So it's an implied duty, uh, implied, uh, which means that whenever you start an arbitration, even if there is no text, the jurisprudence considers that you still have a, an obligation to protect the confidentiality of whatever is being produced, whatever is being said, and whatever information are being uh, provided in the arbitration. Same in the US. The US Federal Arbitration Act is also silent uh, on the issue, but contrary to UK courts, the US courts do not uh, infer any implied duty of confidentiality. So everything is open. There is no confidentiality whatsoever in the United States, unless, again, the parties agree on that. Let's turn now to the uh, United Arab Emirates, for example, in the Arab world, there are <laughs> provisions uh, that address confidentiality. Uh, the case law provides that proceedings are confidential by, unless the parties agree otherwise. So uh, to, the, uh, at the, uh, to the contrary of uh, the law in, uh, in France, for example, or in the US, the proceedings are confidential unless the parties agree that they are not. Uh, not only uh, the national arbitration laws deals with confidentiality, there are also the international arbitration rules. So if you have your arbitration governed by a set of uh, international arbitration rules, that uh, you will most likely find uh, issues uh, or uh, provisions on confidentiality in these rules. 
For example, the London Court of International Arbitration, LCIA, rules uh, provides that there is an obligation of confidentiality and on all documents in arbitration subject to exceptions. There are exceptions. In Dubai as well, the Dubai International Arbitration Center, also there is a general obligation of confidentiality subject to exceptions. Uh, the DIFC, LCIA rules, which has now, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, which has now merged with DIAC, also imposes general obligation of confidentiality. The ICC rules, for uh, by contrast, are silent on the question of confidentialities. Uh, but the rules uh, and contain provisions that enable the tribunal to take orders concerning confidentiality and to take measures to protect confidential information. Let me give you an example here taken uh, from my practice, examples taken from my practice. It happened that uh, sometimes one of the parties asked the other party to provide a copy of a contract that the other party has signed with a third party, which is not a party to the arbitration, uh, containing sensitive commercial information. The party uh, was requested to provide the document will come and say, well, this is confidential. Not, ev uh, not everything in the, uh, not all the information contained in that contract are relevant to the arbitration. And I cannot produce it because there are other information that are confidential and they do not have any effect on that arbitration. Under the ICC rules, the ICC rules gives the arbitrators or the tribunals the power to decide to protect the, conf the confidential information while at the same time ordering the production of the documents, at least in the parts that are related to the arbitration that are material to the arbitration proceedings. For example, the arbitrators can order the production of the contract in question, however, uh, while anonymizing, uh, the uh, redacting the parts that the party considers as are confidential and do not relate to the arbitration. For example, uh, uh, prices, for example, in, in a contract that are not related to the arbitration, that have no impact on the arbitration, can be redacted in black. So this way we can see the parts that are only uh, material are relevant to the arbitration without key and keeping and protecting the confidentiality of other information that is not related to the arbitration. Uh, also, uh, the ancestral rules, the ancestral are the rules that have been drafted or that have been issued by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. These are very widely used uh, rules of arbitration that the parties can agree upon. And uh, they do not include a general confidentiality obligation. <laughs> However, Article 34, Paragraph 5, details the circumstances where the award, only the decision, can be made public. So, which means that there is a, an implied, also there is no provision on confidentiality, but the uh, if uh, there are conditions, special situations where the award can be, can be made public, which means that, a contrario, that it is confidential. Okay, what are the recommendations that we can, one can make to the tribunals here, to the arbitral tribunal? First of all, the first recommendation is that to get the parties to agree from the beginning on the use of the IBA rules of evidence in the procedural rules governing the arbitration. So from uh, because the IBA rules contain a solution to most of uh, the issues of document production and to confidentiality. Also, the tribunal is, can be recommended to issue from the beginning a protective order with respect to the confidentiality of a document, I just gave you an example. For example, if a document, a party invokes confidentiality regarding a document that it is requested to produce, the arbitrators or the tribunal can issue an order uh, uh, taking measures, ordering measures to protect the confidential part of that document. Uh, also, 
uh, irrespective or before the, the, any request for production of document or before the submission of any uh, information that is confidential in the arbitration, it is recommended for the tribunal and the parties to agree from the beginning on how to deal with the issues of confidentiality. Okay. okay, so what if any of these recommendations was not followed in, uh, in a particular case? Here, uh, it is recommended, and then a party comes and asks for the production of a confidential document or wants to, pro to produce a document, but uh, uh, it contains in confidential uh, doc uh, information. It is recommended here that the tribunal, before uh, releasing the document to the other party, asks for the party. And then they can assess whether there are truly confidential information that shouldn't be seen by the other party or not. If uh, the document contains such confidential information that really needs to be uh, protected, then the, arb the uh, arbitrators have the power to take the measures irrespective of any other of the rules to redact, for example, the parts that are confidential in that document. Finally, okay, uh, that uh, the second situation is very sensitive. And I know that I am talking before lawyers. Uh, sorry. Yes. Oh, the third uh, issue is whether the tribunals can disqualify counsel. It, which means parties' lawyers, one of the parties' lawyers, in, in from representing uh, its, his client in the arbitration because of conflict of interests. This is something that has that happens in practice. Let me give you first an example. An ex the first example is, or the main example is that a party is rep uh, represents. Uh, or a lawyer represents a party in an arbitration against another party. And then the other party comes and says, well, yes, uh, they are represented. You have the, the right to be represented by a lawyer of your choice. However, your lawyer, the, law the other party's lawyer, was my lawyer several years ago. So, or a couple of years ago, or was in any, uh, in so somehow involved in in a case where he had access to confidential information within my uh, within my company, and now he is representing the other party in the my uh, my uh, opposing parties, my opponent in the other arbitration. So he has a conflict of interest. So I want this lawyer to be disqualified. So I ask the tribunal to forbid that lawyer from continuing. Uh, to represent the uh, the party, the other party. This is a very sensitive issue. Does the tribunal have the power to sanction counsel's conflict of interest by disqualifying him from the case? Do I have, as an arbitrator, the power to do so? The question has been uh, discussed uh, in several cases that First of all, uh, can we go back uh, to the to the second to the uh, slide? Sorry. Uh, What is the, the tribunal he has here has first to when if asked to do so must take into account first 
very important uh, provisions of law. There is a general principle of law, which is a, a fundamental principle, which relates to human rights, which is the uh, fundamental right to one party to choose legal representation. It is a, a basic right for any party to, to be represented by a lawyer of his own, of his party's choice. You cannot impose on a party in a case, in any case, to choose this lawyer instead of another lawyer, except where, of course, this lawyer cannot be, uh, cannot practice in the country where uh, the case is taking place. But this is not an issue in international arbitration, where there is no requirements for a lawyer to be registered with a bar association of the place of arbitration to represent a party at the arbitration. But this principle is provided for in several human rights and fundamental rights charters like the UN International Covenant, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the African Charter on Human, Ra on human Pe and People's Rights, the Arab Charter on Human Rights, European, European Convention on Human Rights. All of these uh, conventions provide for this fundamental right to choose a lawyer of your choice. So this is very important. Uh, for a, a point to consider by the arbitrators if they are asked to remove a lawyer from a case. Then let's look a little bit, have a look on how the uh, slides, please. Also, there are international soft law instruments. By soft law, it means that these are not hard laws, are not conventions, but these are also guidelines, uh, like the IBA rules uh, for uh, on the uh, obtention of evidence. There are also uh, several soft laws or guidelines that are issued by international organizations, international associations uh, that deal that addresses the issue. the case law of the arbitral tribunals have dealt with the cases. There are few cases where the issue was where the issue was raised. Uh, first of all, the issue was raised in several cases, arbitration cases, under the rules of the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, which is an arbitration center special uh, uh, within the World Bank created or which has been established to uh, decide on arbitrations between foreign investors and the countries where they have their investments. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So there are three cases. In three cases, the tribunals under exit rules have decided to uh, disqualify or to not or or not to disqualify uh, a lawyer from an arbitration. So in a case between uh, in uh, Arvatska versus Slovenia in two thousand and eight. Uh, the Baris, uh, uh, so uh, one uh, lawyer, an English barrister, was representing a party before a tribunal presided by a barrister from the same chambers. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but I don't know if, uh, but how or how barristers' chambers in England uh, function. Barristers' chambers in, uh, in England are not law firms, although they look like, like law firms. But these are only associations of barristers who just who only share the costs of the building where they are and the costs of the staff, etc. But do not share uh, cases, and they are independent. This is a very old law in England, whereby these are, these barristers can even appear against themselves. So a barrister can appear, can represent a party represented by another barrister from the same chambers. 
This is very normal in England. However, in international law, it raises doubts. So the exit uh, uh, tribunal in that case have disqualified the barrister. And another case of 2010, uh, in Rome Petrol versus Romania, uh, the tribunal refused to disqualify a counsel because the tribunal found that the conflict of interest that existed indeed did not threaten the integrity of the arbitral process. What do they mean by that? That sometimes there is a conflict of interest, but the tribunal will look at whether this conflict of interest may uh, uh, may uh, have a consequence on the arbitration itself, itself, not in general. And if, uh, as I see, that the conflict of interest does not have any consequences on the arbitration itself, so they will refuse to disqualify them. And finally, in Fraport versus Philippines, also in two, uh, two, uh, 2010, uh, the uh, tribunal finds that the lawyer had a conflict of interest in the case and that this conflict of interest uh, threatened the, uh, the process uh, of the, uh, the integrity of the tribunal. And in that case, they have decided to disqualify the lawyer. Turning now to the ICC, there are three uh, known cases where ICC tribunals address the issue and refuse to disqualify counsels for different reasons. First, in uh, one ICC tribunal sitting in Canada, they invoked that they do not have the competence to do so, and this is a matter that should be left to the Bar Association. Uh, in another case in New York, an ICC tribunal sitting in New York said uh, refused to disqualify a counsel because uh, they said that this is not for the arbit it's not for us to apply the counsel professional rules so it's not for the tribunal to apply the law on the uh, lawyer's profession in new york and uh, another icc tribunal sitting in dubai refused to disqualify the uh, a lawyer because based on the principle that there is a right for each party to choose a lawyer of his choice, and we cannot, this is a fundamental principle, and it cannot uh, uh, be, uh, uh, it cannot be overcome by the, uh, by the arbitrators. So this is a higher principle. Uh, under the ancestral law, uh, rule, there has been one known case where a conflict of interest was established to certainty, and the tribunal only recommended the immediate voluntary withdrawal of the arbitration, but did not disqualify the counsel. The tribunal said that asked the counsel to withdraw from the case on a voluntary basis, but not but did not force him to resign from the case. So this is how the arbitral tribunals dealt with these issues. By this, uh, I come to the end of my presentation, this webinar, uh, uh, and I am happy to answer any uh, answers you might, uh, the participants might have. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, please raise your hand so I can answer. Yes, please. No questions. I... Okay, so if there are no questions, I think we can bring this webinar to an end. And I hope that you have enjoyed it, despite the small technical uh, problems in the slides. But anyway, I'm at your disposal, uh, even uh, after the webinar, if uh, 
you have any questions regarding a particular, or you want legal advice regarding a particular case uh, uh, among the issues that we have discussed today. Thank you very much.